Hi everybody, welcome to Saturday Live at the Backyard Bird Center. Uh, I know that I sent out a teaser the other day uh, about what the, we were going to be talking about today. And, and, and the topic of shorebirds quite is not as appealing as hummingbirds and other <laughs> topics to, to a lot of you, I'm sure. But you know, a goal of ours is to uh, not only have you uh, enjoy the, the birds of your backyard, but it encourages you to get out and explore the natural world, and especially the world of birds. And shorebirds are, are a group of birds that are, are some of the hardest for uh, people to uh, identify efficiently. And that my goal, I could teach a class, a long class on um, the uh, identifying shorebirds. The goal of today's program is not really to try to teach you how to identify every shorebird out there. I just can't now have time to do that. But is to raise your awareness of them, uh, hopefully to encourage you to get out and look for them, and then to appreciate uh, all of those birds that are out there. And there's two things that when I was preparing for this program that I came up with that are just fascinating to me about, um, and you may be well to you about shorebirds. And one is uh, the reason I'm doing it right now it's because uh, this is fall for shorebirds. And we obviously don't think of it as fall, but when you nest at the top of the world, uh, like most of our shorebirds do, they have a very, very short window to get in one nest, raise some young, and get out of there. Uh, and they migrate through here in the spring, they get up on their nesting territories, up in the Arctic Circle, above the Arctic Circle, far northern Canada, a lot of them, in some of the prairie pothole regions here, but the very far northern birds especially, they have a very small window. And if they get disrupted, um, especially a male can't find a mate, a female can't find a mate, if she, a finesse gets disturbed by a predator and they have to abandon it, they don't have time to nest again. You know, around here, we're used to our, our local birds nesting two and three times in the summer, and sometimes even four times during the morning dose multiple times. But shorebirds have one shot at it. And if they get disturbed, they have to abandon, and, they, and a lot of them just go ahead and start their trek south. And that's why we start seeing shorebirds from up there appearing in local wetlands as early as mid-July. That's fall to them. Wow, that's, uh, that's pretty amazing because... You never know when the weather is going to turn up at the top of the world like that. So uh, shorebirds right now are in, in full migration, starting, this is the early wave of it, but it's starting and the, this the August is a great month to be out. And if you're, in a, you're looking uh, in a wetland, you're out, you find yourself out in a wetland area, it, it's a great time to be looking for all these different shorebirds. Uh, here beside me, the, the, the picture here are a group of American avocets. Well, an incredibly beautiful bird, uh, a, a very diverse bird. I've seen these birds floating uh, and swimming around out in the middle of Smithville Lake. I've seen them a lot, obviously, wading in the water, probing that bill that's turned up in there. So that's just one example. But that's the bird there, kind of eye-catching. But let's get started. All right. So when you're looking for shorebirds, you're obviously going to be looking for wetland areas. And wetland areas, this is Squaw Creek National Wildlife Refuge in the fall, you can see the eagles around. But this very shallow water and the presence of mud are ideal for shorebirds. Now, most of them make their living by probing those bills of different links into the mud and finding worms and, and different kinds of food. One of uh, the most beautiful places I've ever been for shorebirds is, this is actually in coastal Texas. Um, and I don't know if you can see how well it shows up on the screen, but if you look in the zig, and the, uh, you can see all these black dots that are all the way through here. This is, these, those are all shorebirds, different shorebirds. And one of the things that's great that I found fascinating, I uh, started the conversation with uh, about, and the title of the program they have about shorebirds is they do share. And, and it is, uh, uh, they partition the resources. So many of these uh, shorebirds can feed together on the same mud flat and get along perfectly because they're not competing for the same food. They have different uh, feeding styles, they have different feeding needs, and they have different feeding abilities. So 
a bird with a very long bill is going to probe much deeper for its food than a bird with a very short bill, which is going to get there off the surface or just barely below the surface. So I think that's neat among them. They, they, whereas we talk about hummingbirds don't share, uh, the shorebirds get along just fine, and they you know, they're they're out there and they can feed in the same area, and they're taking advantage of different insects and different bugs and things at different levels of the the soil. So it's really cool. So um, you do when you're looking for shorebirds, binoculars are mandatory, and spotting scopes are are very very helpful in getting to see them much closer because a lot of times they are at a distance and so you do want to see them now the uh whenever we're talking about shore i want to just cover the main basic groups of shorebirds most of you are familiar with the killdeer we did the thing on them just recently and that's our most common uh shorebird that we see because they've evolved to nest uh, take advantage in grasslands and in and pastures and in parking lots and places uh, whereas they are truly a member of the plover group and so that's the first type of uh, shorebirds I want to talk about and plovers are short stocky birds that run around and uh, on mud flats uh, or in grass when it comes to their craze and they're usually gleaning there catching their insects and bugs off the surface um, some of them are pretty famous for flipping things up in the air. So a little piece of seaweed, they'll run and they'll throw it up in the air to try to catch a crab that's underneath it. Um, they, they, the plovers are a fascinating group to watch. They run around. Um, here's another example of it. This is a snowy plover, which is uh, very unique here in the central part of the United States. The nest out at Cheyenne Bottoms in central Kansas is a cute little shorebird. They run along and uh, grab their, their, their food right off the surface. So the plovers, short, stocky, don't have very long legs. So they so you usually find them running around on the mud or in, in very shallow water. So, so plovers versus sandpipers. Sandpipers. Sandpipers are, are kind of the famously long, longer legged shorebirds that run around out there. They're usually uh, thinner in nature, not all of them, but most of them are. And they have varying lengths of bills. Uh, this is a greater yellow legs and a lesser yellow legs. Yes, they both do have yellow legs. So how do you tell them apart? Uh, well, that, when you see them side by side, it's very easy. But the, uh, the, the much larger, stouter bill of the greater yellow legs uh, versus the shorter uh, bill and thinner bill of the lesser yellow legs but I like to look, especially in the spring, um, when it's easier, it's the sides of the body. This one has a lot much heavier flanking on the side. And this is very white on the side, so that jumps out at me whenever I'm looking at these, uh, these birds and their uh, nesting uh, plumage, which is a lot of times in the spring and the fall, there's young birds. makes it a little more difficult to use that. But, um, yeah, these are uh, uh, prime examples. One of our most common uh, shorebirds that we see and sandpipers we see run, uh, come through our area. But they're not all the same size. A good example I have here of another yellow legs alongside a least sandpiper, which is very, very small sandpiper versus a large sandpiper. You can see that the height difference is, is huge. And the, the peeps, as these are known as the small sandpipers, we call them peeps, are, are sparrow size, basically. Not much bigger than, than a sparrow. Uh, and they're out feeding in the, the mud, and obviously they're going to be in shallow water as well. So the peeps, the yellow legs, and the plovers that we've talked about so far, those are uh, three, of the, three of the groups. And one that's uh, famously seen here are the dowichers, and they're shorter and plumper birds, they, they, but they are the sewing machines. And that's the other key whenever you're trying to identify shorebirds. Uh, overall body shape, uh, where they're feeding, and how they're feeding. This bird is so easy to identify uh, in that sense. The group of birds is not the separating uh, short billed dowagers, long billed dowagers is, is, a tr is a trick, but these guys are sewing machines. They feed, they're probing, and they look like an old fashioned sewing machine when they're feeding. They're constantly probing that bill into the mud, walking along. Um, uh, and, and, and that's a bird that usually can, be, can jump out at you as how it's feeding as to his presence out there on the mud flat. And then there are lots of others. And that and that's so I just quickly go through those. We showed you the Avocets, um, the Wilson's Fowler Oak, uh, a, a really neat bird. 
uh, one of the most unique birds in our area because the females are actually prettier than the males. They actually have reverse sexual dimorphism, which is a unique thing. Uh, this is a female. And when we see these guys, and yes, the, the, the males do tend the nest and everything. Now, she does lay the eggs, but the male it does the most of the rearing and everything. But when we see these birds, we see them in groups like this come through. And these you can't tell it if this was a video, these birds would be spinning around like tops in the water, and they're turning the water and stirring up food that they can grab with those long, skinny bills. So lots of diversity, lots of fun in the, uh, um, the shorebird world, long-billed curlew. That bill is certainly, you can probe very deep in the mud, uh, kind of rare in our area. Uh, black neck stilts uh, are becoming more common in our area uh, in migration. Really neat, and they have a few nesting, I think, up at uh, Squaw Creek. So these are, they look delicate looking birds, but they, they walk around out in the, a little bit deeper water and probe in with that long bill of air. So a lot of diversity, a lot of fun in the shorebird world. So we do encourage you. To, to, to get out and look for them. They're, they're a fun group of birds to learn and see. And usually uh, spring and fall are your best chances and fall starts now. So it's a good time to get out and take a look at those. Go out to Squaw Creek. Uh, finding shorebird habitat can be challenging just because of rain levels and water management levels of facilities. So uh, two of the most important uh, wetland areas in the whole hemisphere over here are uh, within driving distance, Squaw Creek up in um, Mound City, or Lust Bluff, sorry, the name change, it's going to take years to, for me to do that, and Cheyenne Bottoms and Clavera, about a four-hour drive out in central Kansas. So thanks for joining in. Come by and let's talk birds.